Well, we are in the fourth week now of our series that we are calling Half Truth. And in the course of this series, we've been saying that half truths are statements or beliefs that convey the truth partly. They're half true, which also means, of course, that they are half false. They're sort of right and they're sort of wrong. And that's important because much of the culture and a lot of the people around us, people whom we know, operate as if half-truths are real truths. And that can be a problem. Anytime people aren't operating under the authority of the whole truth, that is and is going to be a problem. Because of it, we can end up in places we don't want to be. On the other hand, we can think more clearly, we can operate more successfully, we can exercise far better judgment if we know the difference between truth and half-truth. So we've been examining half-truths, and this coincides with some major feasts in our church, feasts celebrating some of the major truths of our faith. Three weeks ago, we celebrated the ascension, the truth of Jesus ascended to heaven to be with his Father. Next came Pentecost, honoring the truth of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Last week, Trinity Sunday, honoring the truth that God is one and God is three. And today, we are celebrating Corpus Christi. If we translate the Latin words, we get the body of Christ. And on this day, we celebrate the truth that Christ is really present in the Eucharist. Now, these feasts that we have been celebrating, and as we go through this series, as I said, help us confront some of the half-truths we might encounter. Half-truths like, there are many ways to God. We talked about that one in the first week. Then, you don't need God to connect to the church. Another one, all religions are the same, and one that is still upcoming, God won't give you more than you can handle. All of these are half truths. They speak the truth, but not completely. The half truth that we want to confront today is one that is not so much present in our culture, but one that exists within the church herself. It is an important element of our Catholic faith. And I want to acknowledge that there may be some of you with us today who have connected with our church and who are Christian, but not Catholic, or perhaps you're someone who is considering connecting with us and you're just checking us out, you have no particular faith background or tradition. And if that describes you, I'm glad that you're with us. Welcome. So to begin with, let me acknowledge that there may be some who do not agree with what I have to say, and I may or I may not change your mind, and that's okay. As we said last week, in last week's message, naming and speaking frankly different points of view and being honest about them need not hurt relationships. In fact, it can strengthen them. So I'm glad if you're not a Catholic or if you're uncertain of your faith. I'm glad that you're here, even if you don't agree, at least at this point, if you don't agree with our viewpoint on this subject. I hope that today, after today at least, you may feel that you better understand it. Now this topic is a little bit, we might say, dense. There's a lot to it. I will do my best to make it interesting, but do not feel, whether you are a lifelong Catholic or otherwise, don't feel you have to hang on to every single point. And if you only walk away as a non-Catholic or someone with no particular faith tradition, if you only walk away thinking, wow, there's, there's more there than I thought there was, that's good. And so, onward we go. The half-truth that we're going to confront today is very prevalent, it's common, and it's under-acknowledged. We don't speak of it as much as we should. The half-truth is this. The Eucharist is a symbol. The communion we share at Mass, the Eucharist, is a symbol. Now, I said this is a half-truth. So, it is true that it is a symbol. All the sacraments are symbols or signs. In fact, the textbook definition of sacrament, there are several, but one of them goes like this. A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ. All of the sacraments are signs. They use symbols. Baptism uses water, confirmation, which we hope one day, someday, eventually to celebrate for the young people of our parish. It's been postponed twice now. Confirmation uses oil. And here at Mass there is, as you know, bread and wine. A sacrament is a sign given by Christ to show himself, to show us that he wants to nourish us and strengthen us and care for us. And so if anyone says communion is a symbol, they're right. That's true, but it's only half true because we haven't yet finished our definition of a sacrament. And here it is. A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ 
to impart grace. There is an outward peace, a visible peace, the sign, and then there's a hidden peace. And the hidden peace is all about grace, about God sharing his life, about what God is doing in the sacrament. To get the whole truth regarding the Eucharist, we're going to look at a passage from Mark's Gospel, which we just heard. Now, I noted that the sacraments were instituted, which means started, begun, by Christ. And we're going to look at exactly when he did that. We can read about it in all the Gospels, as well as in other places in the New Testament, in one of Paul's letters as well. But here is how Mark tells the story. So Mark writes, On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now, to appreciate the Eucharist at all, you need to know about the Passover meal. Jesus was Jewish, and like all pious Jews, he celebrated the Passover meal every year. Passover celebrates a historic event, God delivering the Jewish people from Egyptian slavery. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years, and then one day, as we know if we know our Bible stories that we learned as a, ch a child, or perhaps later in life, one day God cal calls this fellow named Moses, and he calls him to lead his people out of that slavery. So as the story continues, Moses goes to the Pharaoh, who is the king, and he says this. God says, let my people go to worship me. Notice at first, Jesus doesn't even ask for freedom, just the freedom to worship. But the Pharaoh said, no, I'm not giving up all my free labor, even for a few days. And then came, if you're familiar with the story, those famous plagues in which God helped the Pharaoh feel the pain of his bad decision. It is, by the by, an unfortunate truth of life, but a definite fact that often we don't change as we should, unless and until we feel pain. Perhaps that speaks in some way to what we're going through in our church these days and these times in Canada. We don't change until we feel pain, sadly. But that is another message or even another series. And so, to continue with the story, the Pharaoh, even despite these plagues, remains obstinately opposed to Moses' plan. And so God sends the plagues, as we, as we mentioned, and the final plague, which is death. All sin leads, in some way, to some form of death. And the consequence of Pharaoh's sin is the death of all the firstborn in his kingdom. And to protect the Jewish people from this terrible punishment, God instituted Passover. Now, finally, we're coming back to the beginning of our gospel story. But we're going to tell you about the Passover first. So, the Passover, the story of the Passover. God, through Moses, instructed each Jewish household to select a lamb, an unblemished male lamb, in other words, one that was more expensive. They were to select it and then to sacrifice it as an act of worship. And then to smear the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of the house as a sign that would save them and eventually their lives. And then they had to eat the lamb. They had to eat the lamb that had been sacrificed to receive the sacrifice. After the night of Passover and the death of his own son, the Pharaoh finally allowed the Israelites to leave. Essentially, he tells them to go out and never come back. It was the celebration of Passover that kickstarts all the other events we read about in the book of Exodus, the story of the journey of the people of Israel from Egypt to Israel, a journey from slavery to freedom, and in the process becoming the children of God. And after that, every year the Jewish people would celebrate the Passover, as Jesus did in his day. The Passover that we read about in the Gospels wouldn't have been the first one that Jesus celebrated. He celebrated it all his life with Joseph and Mary, among others. So they celebrated it each year, but they didn't celebrate it in the way that we would celebrate something today. They didn't celebrate it in the way we would celebrate a birthday or an anniversary. For the Jewish people, when they celebrated Passover, they weren't just remembering it. They believed that they were living it, or at least reliving it. Celebrating it was participating in it. The language of the Passover celebration, even today, at the very beginning, the father of the household says, why is tonight not like any other night? Not why was some night thousands of years ago. Why is tonight not like any other night? They were making it present once again. 
By taking part in the Passover, they believed that in some mysterious way they were really making it present once again. And then Mark tells us, while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take. This represents my body. A little bit of a joke there. That's not what he actually said. He said, Take. This is my body. And in a similar way, he goes on. Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. At the Passover meal, the cup would have contained wine, but Je Jesus doesn't tell them to drink wine. Instead, he says, This is my blood. This is my body. This is my blood. It's not at all ambiguous. It's not the least bit unclear. The word in the original Greek is just as simple, and it means the same thing, estin, is. This is my body. This is my blood. The bread is his body, and the wine is his blood. That's what he said, and we believe what he said. And that's important, because what is missing from the description of the meal, what is strangely never even mentioned, is the lamb. And that's strange because the lamb was the central element. It was the centerpiece of the table and of the celebration. It was the indispensable piece when it came to celebrating the Passover. You couldn't, you couldn't do Passover without the lamb. And here at the Last Supper, Jesus is doing something entirely different when it comes to the Passover meal. He shifts the focus away from the lamb, away from the lamb's body and blood, and turns it to himself, to his own body and blood. Just as the lamb was given up for the Jewish people to save them and set them free, Jesus is saying that now, here, in the Eucharist, his body, his blood, is given up to save us and to set us free. The bread is his body. The wine is his blood. And just as the Jews had to eat the lamb to receive the sacrifice, we've got to consume communion. We know this in our bones as Catholics. That's why the current situation, when we're denied that opportunity, has weighed so heavy on our hearts. Jesus initiated this new Passover meal in a once and for all, never to be repeated sacrifice. This has been a point of controversy between ourselves and many of our Christian brothers and sisters. They think we deny that. He initiated this new Passover meal in a once and for all, never to be repeated sacrifice. A sacrifice that is the cross. The cross is where this sacrifice happened, once and for all, for everyone and forever, never to be repeated. It is a never to be repeated sacrifice that he actually instructs us, this is where it gets interesting, he instructs us to celebrate over and over and over again. It's basically what we do when we come together as a church family, that's what we do. On Sundays. And just as the Jewish people believed that by celebrating the Passover, they were participating in the Passover, we believe that we are participating in the death and resurrection of Christ when we celebrate the Mass. That somehow, mysteriously, and remember, a mystery is not something that we don't know about. We know about it, but we can't fully understand it. And somehow, through this mystery, Christ is really present. Now today, as I have mentioned, and as you know very well, today is the Feast of Corpus Christi, and this feast is given to us to reinforce the truth that what is received at communion is not just a symbol. It is really the body and blood of Christ. So what do we do with that information? Well, there's lots of things, really, but here are three things I'm going to bring to your attention, depending on your circumstances in life. First, for those who are not Catholic, I hope that this has given you some insight, insight into what we believe we are doing as Catholics. And if you are so moved, when the day arrives, when we can come together once again, I hope that you join us. And you're welcome to participate with us in the Mass, not just to observe, but to participate. Participate, again, one day when we're allowed to sing in the music. Participate in the responses to the prayers and the prayers that we say together and in the worship of our Lord. 
And then one day when we're back in the church and communion time comes, you are welcome to step forward and receive a blessing. And the sign for that is to cross your arms. Second, for those who are Catholic, but maybe not all in as the saying goes. You know you're Catholic, you're interested, but you're not fully committed. Perhaps I could challenge you to take this opportunity to look at raising the bar a little bit for yourself when it comes to the Eucharist. Perhaps make coming here when we can or joining us online, one or the other even, a more regular part, a more regular event in your life or a greater priority in your week. There's always many choices that we have to make. Choose the Eucharist more regularly as a higher priority. Make it part of your lifestyle, a lifestyle choice, a part of who you are. It's just what you do. And because we're not static in this life, we continue to grow a part of who you are becoming. A part of your building character as you build and grow with your family. Finally, third, for the rest of you and for me as well, this is a perfect opportunity this feast day for us to rethink our attitude towards this celebration. And indeed, the past few weeks really also we could look on as having been given to us to do just that. When something is taken away, we can have a clearer and more profound sense of its importance. So ask yourself, and I will ask myself as well, how prayerfully do we approach the Eucharist when we have the opportunity to come? Do we abstain from food and drink immediately before coming to Mass? That's a discipline of the sacrament. Are we mindful and repentant of our sin as a way of preparing? Yes, we do it as a community at the beginning of Mass, but we should also do it as individuals before we come. Do we also try and spend a few quiet moments before Mass reflecting on the goodness and power of what is about to happen? In the same way, after Mass, do we immediately make a dash for our car, or do we take a few moments in our pew to prayerfully and gratefully acknowledge what we have received? Do we return to the world with new resolve in terms of those things we're called to do and to be, in terms of charity and service and mission? Is there anything different in our lives after our communion than before our communion because it's a gift that can transform us and our life. Is there anything different in our lives after our communion than before? Or to put it another way, are we becoming what we receive?